So morning everybody. My name is Carsten Merker. I'm one of the Debian developers who are working on the Debian Risk 5 port. And today I'm going to tell you the story of how the Debian Risk 5 port came to life, um, what we have achieved until now, which obstacles we had to tackle to add a completely new architecture to a binary distribution like Debian. I'll show you what we have achieved, what we are planning to achieve, and give you an outlook about what we hope to have within the next one and two years. I'll start with a short introduction of the RISC-V architecture because I know there are people around here who come from the Debian side, not from the RISC-V side, and are not familiar with the details of RISC-V, so I keep it short. <laughs> so what's RISC-V? RISC-V is a CPU instruction set architecture that has been designed at the University of Berkeley, originally as a student project, has grown a bit since then, and uh, everybody is free to implement CPUs based on the RISC-V ISA. And um, the specification that defines this ISA is available under free license, under CC BY. And um, to make sure that implementations actually conform to the specification, the RISC-V Foundation uh, has registered trademarks on the name RISC-V. And you're only allowed uh, to call your implementation RISC-V if it actually conforms to the spec, to make sure that we don't get incompatible implementations. Um, the RISC-V ISA exists in three different variants. It's available in 32-bit, 64-bit, and still work in progress 128-bit. So for practical purposes, it's 32-bit and 64-bit right now. Um, it has been designed to be modular, to scale from microcontrollers up to supercomputing, and um, the ISA designers are trying to have only non patentable technology in the ISA specification so that it is possible uh, to actually implement a RISC-V CPU without having to buy patent licenses. There is no formal legal guarantee for that, um, but uh, the designers have put quite a bit of effort to make sure there are no patent problems. So we know what RISC-V is, what RISC-V is not. RISC-V is not a specific CPU. It's just an instruction set architecture, the set of commands and the behavior, but not a specific chip. And uh, while the specification is under free license, uh, there's of course the possibility to implement uh, proprietary CPUs based on the ISA. There are already some. And uh, one thing that's somewhat of a problem for open source projects is that the stewardship uh, of RISC-V in the hands of the RISC-V Foundation uh, is open in the way the semiconductor industry defines the term open, but not exactly in the way open source projects define the term open. All the specific specifications, once they are released, uh, are available under free licenses, so no problem with that. But um, taking part in the specification process itself um, requires a RISC-V Foundation membership, which requires signing a non-disclosure agreement, which is why many open source developers like me are not a member of the foundation. Most of the software stuff is actually handled outside the foundation, but the actual ISA specification runs inside the foundation and uh, getting access to pre-release documents actually requires membership. Everybody can become a member as a personal member, um, but uh, personal members don't have voting rights, uh, so actual decisions uh, get made by corporate entities in the foundation. So why is it called RISC-V? That's rather easy. It's a classical risk architecture, like there have already been a lot, and it's the fifth major risk architecture designed at Berkeley, so the name is rather obvious. There have been other risk architectures, uh, for example, MIPS. If you have a DSL router at home, chances are about 95% uh, that it's MIPS-based. If you're carrying a smartphone, it's about 95% ARM-based. And there are several others. Um, most of them are closed architectures designed by companies. Uh, MIPS is just now slowly changing. There is opening up a bit. Um, Sun Microsystems has actually uh, specified Spark. Uh, in an IEEE standard, but that standard itself is not freely available. So one has to buy the standard, uh, which again is not nice for open source communities. There has been OpenRISC, an actual open CPU instruction set architecture. Um, so why yet another one? There are already so many to choose from. Um, yeah, RISC-V has been designed uh, at university. One of the targets of the architecture has been teaching. And closed architectures are not suitable for teaching because you're legally not allowed to just implement an x86 CPU uh, without having a license from Intel and AMD. Spark has the problem that it's only halfway open and uh, the Spark designers have actually made some choices that, well, 
people wouldn't do now today. And OpenRisk is a fully open design, but OpenRisk has a historical problem. Um, originally, when OpenRisk was designed, um, one of the GCC porters for OpenRisk um, didn't allow a copyright assignment of his code contributions to the FSF, and the FSF requires a copyright assignment to get code in GCC upstream. Without this copyright assignment, support for OpenRisk could never go upstream, which is why all efforts uh, to broaden the use of OpenRisk have actually failed. Right now, this has changed. An OpenRisk developer is right now working on re-implementing all the OpenRisk GCC support and getting it upstream. But, uh, well, in the meantime, we have several years of risk Drive, so we'll see. Um, risk Drive has been designed uh, to avoid some of the decisions that older architectures uh, have had. It's designed to be easily possible, to be easily implementable, uh, and to be extendable at the same time. We'll get to the extensions in a few minutes. One thing that's important is that Risk Drive follows a strict upstream policy, so all toolchain stuff is handled in upstream. So we don't want 5,000 forks of bin utils, compilers, whatever. We want to have everything standard in upstream. The ISA itself um, consists of several, several modules uh, which are labeled with characters, as you can see there. There's the base ISA, which is just the integer operations. Um, there's hardware multiply, atomics, um, single and double precision floating point, and all those together are called the general purpose set, which is what one would expect for a system to run Linux, BSD, whatever. Then there's the compressed instruction set, uh, which is actually not new instructions, but a shorter encoding for existing instructions. Normal instructions in risk are 32 bits long. Uh, the compressed instructions uh, provide a selected set of instruction with a shorter 16-bit encoding, which has the advantage of using, having less cache pressure, um, having less memory bandwidth requirements, better performance. And um, if one wants to specify which bits of the ISA CPU supports, uh, you get an ISA, an ISA specifier like you can see below. IMAFD is RB64G. Um, when the Linux distributions have started porting for RISC-V, we had to decide about uh, whether to assume the compressed extension as available or not that had some discussions at that time. Uh, all the binary distributions that are working on RISC-V support right now um, assume that the C extension is there. There is work on a platform specification which defines that all RISC-V Unix-style platforms shall have the C extension. Um, the ISA has three privilege modes. Machine mode is the highest level. Microcontrollers usually only implement machine mode. If you want to run Linux or BSD, you need all three modes. Um, the 32, 64, and 128-bit ISAs are actually independent from each other. That's probably strange to people who are used uh, Intel architecture, where every 64-bit CPU also runs 32-bit code. That's not the case on RISC-V. Uh, we have a similar effect on ARM64. ARM64 CPUs can optionally support 32-bit code, but they don't have to. And actually, there's quite a bit of ARM64 servers which only run 64-bit code and no 32-bit code. Short side note on Meltdown and Spectre. Um, in discussions about RISC-V, often people uh, claim, yeah, RISC-V is, is the solution uh, to Meltdown and Spectre. It's an open architecture. We won't have any problems with that. It's just nonsense. Because Meltdown and Spectre are implementation bugs. They are not a bug in the design of the instruction set architecture, but in specific chip implementations. So while currently we have no RISC-V chips which do speculative execution, which is the base for Spectre and Meltdown, so currently there is no RISC-V chip that's vulnerable. Nobody can guarantee that that won't happen in the future when we get chips that do speculative execution. So now we have an ISA, but if we want to use an ISA, we would like to have hardware or at least otherwise run code. There are multiple options. We can do QEMU emulation. QEMU has support for both user space as well as full system emulation. Uh, we have CPU designs, which can be instantiated in field programmable gate arrays. I'll get to that later on. And uh, we also have uh, real CPU chips. Last year at FOSDEM, uh, we had the presentation of the Sci-Fi Freedom U540, which is the first Linux capable RISC-V chip in the world. Um, there is the Loris project, which is working uh, on designing 
an, a community SOC, um, but that's still a lot of work and until we actually have those chips on our desks will probably take three, four, five more years. Doing chip design is hard and well, it needs work and needs to be paid. Then there's Shakti. Uh, Shakti is a project in India uh, which um, aims at designing a full family of RISC-V chips from small IoT style embedded stuff up to supercomputer hardware. And the Shakti team has recently um, actually taped out the first locally produced uh, Linux capable chip. So what you here see is a, is a picture of actual RISC-V hardware. The left one is the prototype that had been presented at last Falstam. The right one is uh, one of the early glibc development systems. That is the prototype chip. That is an FPGA board which acts as Southbridge and provides PCI Express. And that's a PCI Express NVMe SSD. <laughs> so why porting Debian to RISC-V? Um, from a philosophic point of view, Debian and RISC-V are a perfect match. We have open source hardware, we have open source software, and we would like to combine those two. There have been efforts uh, of porting uh, Debian to OpenRISC, but those have not been successful because of the GCC problematic, because we would have to ha have uh, shipped different GCC versions uh, on different platforms, which is something that Debian does not do. Debian uses the same versions on all platforms, uh, so that was not an option. Um, the RISC-V ISA is probably the first open ISA that has a realistic chance of actually gaining mass market traction. There are a lot of companies uh, supporting RISC-V, right now, and things in the semiconductor industry are slowly changing. Um, it's become slowly possible to actually have community-led <coughs> chip production. It's still very much expensive, but things are changing in the industry, and within a few years, it might be possible to actually have community-led chip designs mass-produced. Yeah, uh, the first work on porting Debian has started in early 2015, and at that time, a lot of stuff was still in movement. Uh, Binutils GCC were changing every day. Um, GLibc was in its early infancy, um, the Linux kernel as well. Things have been changing about every two days, and uh, code generation actually got incompatible from one week to another because of changes in the compiler in the Binutils which meant, uh, well, um, if I build stuff today, I probably cannot link it against stuff built in two weeks, which is kind of sad if you want to do a binary distribution. Then there was somewhat of a culture clash uh, between people from the hardware design world and from the software design world that took, say, half a year to sort all that out. And um, another problem was at that time we had no QEMU support, so there was only Spike. Spike is a CPU architecture emulator, which emulates um, a basic RISC-5 CPU. It only emulates a block device and a dump serial console, but no network. So um, think you want to put separate distribution, you build a root file system with something, you want to compile something, and find, okay, I need another bit of software. Well, normally you just download it, but if you have no network, that's kind of difficult. So shut down emulator, unmount block device, mount block device on host, copy files in, unmount block device, start emulator again, start working. If you have done that 20 times, you want something else. <laughs> yeah, due to the ABI breaks and the incompatibilities in the tool chain, um, all early attempts at actually building packages uh, have not been successful. So both Fedora and Debian developers have chosen uh, instead to work on getting stuff upstream and getting stuff, Binutils, GCC, GLibc, kernel stabilized so that we have a stable RBI and can be sure that stuff that we build today still works tomorrow. Um, that uh, included some modifications to the linker for Debian style multi-arc support. Um, that included um, getting an agreement about using device tree for hardware description, similar to what we use on ARM and on PowerPC, and recently also on MIPS. And well, things were looking quite well until early 2016, and we had some form of déjà vu, because um, we wanted to get GCC support upstream, and the people who wrote the GCC support uh, were happy to do a copyright assignment. Unfortunately, some of them had work contracts with the University of California, which gave the UCB 
the copyright in some of their comp contributions. And UCB was happy to license the stuff under, under free license, under GPL, under BSD, no problem. But they were not willing to agree to a copyright assignment. So we were exactly in the same situation that the open risk people had been facing beforehand. And things were looking dire, rather dire. It took nearly a year to get the legal stuff sorted out. So end of 2016, the stuff could actually go upstream. And from then on, Binutils and GCC uh, went rather fast. Uh, just a few weeks after the legal stuff had been sorted out, uh, Binutils went upstream. Three months later, GCC was upstream. Then came GLIPC and kernel. The GLIPC and the kernel are very much dependent on each other because they use low-level interfaces. And getting that specified out uh, so that the GLIPC people were happy and that the kernel people were happy uh, took nearly a further year from there on. So uh, effectively, at last Fostum, exactly one year ago, we were there that we had toolchain, kernel, things were working, things were upstream. We could start with the bootstrap of the distribution. There were some tools that were still missing. Uh, GDB Linux support is still missing. We have bare metal support, but not for Linux debugging. As you have heard probably in the talk before, uh, LLVM and Clang support is still work in progress. We hope to sometime this year have a release um, that will properly work for distribution users. Java has been a problem. We have uh, Java support now, but only interpreter support, not just in time compiler support. So Java works, but it's dog slow. Getting JIT support is still quite a bit of work. Uh, Rust depends on LLVM. Golang is something that, to my knowledge, nobody is working on. Okay, somebody is working on Golang. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, there are, of course, other languages and other compilers. Um, V8 is the JavaScript engine for Node.js, which is also not working yet. yet. So now we have compilers, we have binutils, we can build code, we can build packages. But we are starting from scratch. We have nothing for the RISC-V architecture. So how do I get a distribution from thin air where I have nothing? Well, I need a cross-compiler. So I run a compiler on a PC but generate code for RISC-V and make use of the Debian multi-architecture support, uh, which allows us to have code for multiple architectures within one root file system. So I can gradually generate packages for a new architecture. Um, that, of course, requires getting RISC-V support into the, into the toolchain packages that we had in Debian. But as the support had just been released a few weeks ago, the Binutils GCC packages in Debian, of course, did not yet have RISC-V support. So the first step was actually packaging new versions of all that and getting them into experimental. Then, how does one start in bootstrapping a new architecture? I need a, a base set of packages. So which packages and how many are that? Well, um, Debian has package priorities, and the packages with the priority required are the, are the base package set. And well, priority required, OK, that's easy. It's just a handful of packages. That's 55 packages. That's no problem. Well, actually, it is. Because those packages have dependencies. They want libraries. And those libraries have dependencies themselves. And to, make, to be able to build those libraries, I need a lot of other stuff. So I need dependencies of dependencies of dependencies of dependencies of dependencies to build stuff, which ends up in several hundred packages. I have stopped counting at nearly 400. Um, one of those problems is that, um, for example, if you have source code that uses Mison to build, Mison uh, uses Python, and Python Building Python is a problem in so far as Python has lots of dependencies because Python has, um, um, has modules for a ton of stuff. And to build Python, the Python package, you have to have all that stuff. So that gets a lot of, rather large dependency chain. Um, dependency issues are twofold. Uh, one are deep dependency chains, uh, as I've just shown an example. Um, to build one of the command line base packages, uh, we had to cross build some 80 or 90 other packages just to get the build environment set up to be able to compile a, simul, a single simple package. Another problem are circular dependency chains, uh, which is where the cat chases its tail. Uh, packages in the base system are, for example, audit. 
Audit requires open LDAP for building. Open LDAP in turn requires Cyrus SASL for building. Cyrus SASL requires PAM for building. And PAM requires audit for building. So the cat has just found its tail. How to resolve that? Um, we have um, to build packages uh, with smaller feature sets to just remove certain features from the packages to break the cycle. And doing that by hand is rather tedious. Uh, so Debian has a mechanism uh, for that um, that is called build profiles. So you can build a package with different feature profiles. Uh, and uh, during the bootstrap process, uh, we actually have added several build profiles to a number of packages to be able to break those dependency cycles. What, what you see here <laughs> is a dependency graph of Firefox, just to give you an impression. That on top there is the Firefox source. The boxes that are led to by the brownish lines are direct build dependencies of Firefox. Each of those build dependencies has runtime dependencies, which are all those bluish lines going to different packages. And that's just the first level of dependencies, because all of those bluish, bluish packages have depend build dependencies on their own, which have runtime dependencies. So if you look at that graph, you can probably imagine um, that building Firefox comes very, very, very late in the bootstrap process. I've said that we've started cross-building because we had no native code. Um, and cross-building is not as easy as doing native builds. Um, several packages which build fine natively uh, don't cross-build properly. Um, there are differences in cross-build support in different build systems. Uh, people often say uh, GNU Auto Tools, uh, old stuff, ugly stuff, M4, uh, just leave me alone. But uh, GNU Auto Tools has one major advantage. Cross-building effectively works out of the box. Effectively, everything built with Auto Tools just cross-builds. That's unfortunately something that we cannot say about many CMake and Meson-based projects. Uh, both CMake and Meson have, in theory, support for cross-building. But uh, many packages that use Meson and CMake don't make use of the infrastructure uh, that those two provide. And in practice, uh, we had to fiddle around with many of the Meson and CMake using packages to actually make them cross-build. Perl is, well, just strange. Perl claims to be cross-buildable. Well, the way Perl cross-building works is that the Perl configure script requires an SSH connection to a system already running the architecture I want to build for and then run the configure script natively on the architecture, which obviously does not work in a bootstrapping scenario. So the only way uh, to build Perl is actually build all the rest. So I have a native compiler and then build Perl natively. Another common problem is um, generators. Make files um, sometimes um, compile code, which they then execute to, exec uh, to generate further source code. That works on a native build, so if the, if the compiler is running on a PC and uh, the binary I'm creating is for a PC, no problem with that. But in the cross-build setting, I'm running a compiler on a PC but generating code for RISC-V, and the PC cannot just execute the RISC-V code. So that does not work. Uh, Proper build systems should take care of that and in a cross-build setting use the proper compiler for, uh, the, for the code generators. Another option, if one has QEMU support, uh, is using QEMU userland emulation. Uh, that helps, but we didn't have that in the beginning. Another thing is uh, that many upstream packages um, don't properly uh, separate between host arch and build arch tools. Uh, so if I, for example, want to call package config, to get the uh, GCC parameters uh, for linking to library. Um, those are at least somewhat architecture dependent. So I need the package config for the correct architecture. And many make files just don't take that into account and always call um, the package config for the architecture the compiler runs on, which is wrong if I'm cross compiling. And then there are some cases of packages that are not multi-arch codes double with themselves, that can happen. I'm using a tool to build a package which has a library dependency. And the code I'm trying to compile for RISC-V also requires the same library in the RISC-V version. With most libraries in Debian, it's possible to co-install both at the same time, but there are libraries where that doesn't or doesn't yet properly work, so we had to work around that. Then there's, of course, general portability stuff. Um, data type sizes are architecture dependent. Um, how long is an int? Is an int 16 bits, 32 bits, 64 bits? 
that changes from architecture to architecture. There's endiness, so um, the way numbers are represented in memory. A very common occurrence is um, that upstream ships outdated config sub and config guess autocon files. Um, the FSF uh, recommends that uh, autocon users should always regenerate config sub and config guess from current upstream so that new architectures automatically get supported. But many upstream authors just put the versions they have used when building the release table, which are old and they don't know about risk v so we had to replace those. Um, another thing that's rather common is atomic support. Um, there is a, a tiny but important difference uh, how to call, how to link in libp thread. There is the dash p thread flag to the compiler and just dash lp thread which just links the library. Problem with that is on PCs just linking the p thread library is enough that works. That's the case for x86 and AMD64. That's not the case for quite a bunch of other architectures. And uh, as most developers probably develop on PC hardware, they just don't look at something like that. So we had to patch quite a number of packages for that. And then there are packages uh, that actually require handcrafting header files for each new architecture. libgpg error is one of those examples. Then uh, there's type constraints. We have atomics. But on RISC-V, atomics uh, are only supported uh, on native word sizes, not on smaller objects. The PC architecture allows um, using atomics on arbitrary object sizes. Uh, that's not the case on RISC-V. We have libatomic, which abstracts that away. So if people use libatomic, that's not a problem. But again, many upstream projects uh, just assume that atomics work on arbitrary sizes because that's just the case on PCs. But that's not true for all other, for all other architectures. And then there is, of course, stone-edged stuff like looking in the X11 sources, which doesn't uh, make decisions based on properties like if an int is 32-bit, then do something. If you look into the X11 sources, there's really, if architecture is foo, then list of code. If architecture is bar, then list of code. If architecture is buzz, list of code. And so we had to write just new code for that. Uh, we tried to get it upstream, but that didn't work because the X11 developers don't want to add uh, code for new architectures because they say X11 is in maintenance mode and um, we don't want new architectures upstream. And then, of course, there's the problem of compiler support. We lack Rust. So building, for example, Firefox and some other stuff currently does not work because we don't have a working Rust compiler yet. Yeah. Doing all the package bootstrap, getting the ordering right, um, patching packages is rather tedious. And uh, of course, we would like to have that automated. Fully automating that is way more complicated than one would expect at first sight. Um, a Debian developer has some years ago written his master thesis about bootstrapability issues, which has helped a lot. And um, there's a tool by Helmut Grone, which is called Rebootstrap, uh, which at least as far as possible, uh, automates the early bootstrap. So getting binutils, getting compiler, uh, getting various GNU tools, getting several basic libraries, uh, which, we were which we were very happy to have. So now we have packages, uh, but we want to have a proper distribution. So we need to get those packages into Debian infrastructure. Debian has two major types of architecture. Um, so regular architectures, which have regular stable releases, get security support for stable releases, and we have ports architectures, which is somewhat of the, well, of the kindergarten of Debian architectures. New architectures usually start in ports because they're incomplete, uh, there might be stability issues at the beginning, and uh, bugs in ports architectures don't influence regular architectures, so just unstable, sta uh, unstable testing, stable migrations on Regular architectures uh, still runs even if a package is broken on one of the ports architectures. Then uh, for ports architectures, um, we have a bit more freedom. For example, uh, the ports architectures have an additional suite in the Debian archive, which is called unreleased, which is allowed to carry architecture-specific patches, which are not in the main package source. This is only um, for temporary stuff, so the aim is that having unreleased empty. That's the final aim. But uh, while we're working on that, there is some stuff which we 
currently can only keep in unreleased. So um, that's where we are right now. We have a bunch of packages. Um, we aim at becoming a regular Debian architecture sometime in the future, but um, that requires being able to build about 95% uh, of the archive, and we are not there yet. This is a package build graph. The grayish line here has been the percentage of the RISC-V packages that we have been built, that have been built. This graph is several months old. Uh, the spike that you see here has actually been uh, created uh, by porting the Haskell compiler. <laughs> At that point in time, we got Haskell bootstrapped and built a bunch of Haskell packages which gave that rise in available packages. Unfortunately, the number of packages actually has dropped down again in the meantime because um, we have some packages which we had been able to build in the past but we, which we cannot build anymore. One of the problems is um, that uh, several upstream sources that have in the past been using C or C++ are moving to Rust. So we could build the old C or C++ based versions <coughs> but we can't currently build the new Rust based versions so we had to drop out some packages. Another problem uh, is the Qt ecosystem, uh, which in the past has had its own C++ parser, uh, which has now moved to using LLVM, which brings us to the problem that we don't yet have LLVM. Um, we are currently at 85, 80, 84 or 85% of packages, uh, which provides a rather usable system, um, but of course it's not everything yet. To become a release architecture, an officially supported stable release architecture, uh, we need to have Debian installer support. That's work in progress, but not yet finished. Uh, we need to have uh, enough builties with redundancy. Builties are the package builders Debian uses to automatically compile packages for all architectures. And uh, we need to have everything in infrastructure managed by the Debian system administrators, uh, which have requirements, so they want rate-mountable server-grade hardware, remote management capabilities, which is somewhat difficult with small chip prototype development boards. So that's also something we hope to get within the next years, but we haven't yet. And of course, there need to be people to take care of the architecture. Okay, we have those. The Debian installer support uh, is work in progress. It's possible to build a Debian installer for RISC V from Debian installer Git, um, but it's not really usable yet. Uh, we have two issues that are still being worked on. One is that we have problems with ELF utils. Somebody is working on those. Um, that's the last big blocker to get uh, in the Debian installer released. Another thing is that we currently don't yet have um, bootloader support. Uh, the U-boot port for RISC-V is still rather new. Um, just yesterday, two days ago, um, the first OpenSPI code base, uh, which we would need for that, has been published. Uh, so that's something that, we'll, that, I will, that I will look into into the next weeks. <coughs> then there's the topic of 32-bit support. Currently, we only support RV64, 64-bit RISC-V because that's uh, where most of the work has gone in, uh, where we have hardware. 32-bit support is still work in progress because we don't have 32-bit support in glibc yet, and the kernel support for 32-bit is also not complete because that needs to be um, coordinated with glibc. And we have the problem that you might have heard of the year 2038 problem, that we have a time type overflow in a few years. And... Um, we want RISC-V uh, to do that the right way, but that requires infrastructure in the kernel and in glibc, which hasn't been there in previous glibc series, which is just now getting into glibc. And we didn't want to release a 32-bit port um, that would be binary incompatible in a few years because we would have an ABI break uh, to handle the year 2038 problem. So that takes a bit. Um, Fedora and Red Hat probably won't release 32-bit ports. Uh, Debian might do it, we'll see, if interesting hardware becomes available for 32-bit platforms. The way such hardware could become available are small FPGA implementations. Um, designing CPUs on field programmable gate arrays is a common uh, technique in commercial CPU development. Um, but in the open source field, uh, that hasn't been done very much because um, for all available FPGA types, uh, one had to have uh, proprietary, proprietary compiler tool chains 
FPGA toolchains from the big uh, FPGA vendors. And, well, open source developers won't, don't want to build uh, this stuff based on proprietary tools. In recent years, there has been a lot of effort um, to reverse engineer the FPGA bitstream configuration format and to implement free toolchains for FPGAs. We actually have one that's fully working, that's Project iStorm, which is packaged in Debian. So uh, you can actually implement a CPU with the tools in Debian and run it on an FPGA. Um, there's Project Trellis, uh, which is currently work in progress. Uh, there's a talk uh, tomorrow, just upstairs from here, from the Project Trellis project leader about uh, his support for the ECP5 FPGA series. What's interesting with the ECP5 is that it's about 10 times the size than the small IS-40 that we have supported right now. Problem with the size is um, I can implement a CPU on a Lattice IS-40, but uh, that's more microcontroller class. Something Linux capable with memory management unit in that size is very, very difficult. Um, David Shaw has actually implemented an open risk CPU on uh, an ECP5 and is planning uh, also to do a RISC-V implementation on one. Then there's Project X-Ray uh, for even bigger FPGAs from Xilinx. That's in rather early stage. Things are moving forward, but um, I wouldn't hold my breath while waiting. That will probably take one or two more years until we have something that finally works there. Well, FPGAs are nice. I can actually in place update my CPU. If I have a better version of my CPU, OK, compile it, place it in the FPGA, new FPU. A new CPU. Um, but um, FPGA have disadvantages. Um, the clock rates that I can achieve are rather low. So if you get 200 megahertz, that's already rather fast. Um, more realistic on cheap FPGAs is something about 50 megahertz, which by today's standards is just slow. Getting fast chips is rather expensive, and uh, compared with actual mass manufactured ASICs, um, they use a lot of, lot of current. Another problem is getting memory. Um, modern memory interfaces are very, very complex. And uh, attaching modern double data rate memory um, to an FPGA is difficult. Um, that requires a specific file layer. That requires an appropriate memory controller. That's not easy. So uh, we have currently only the choice either use memory that's easier to address, but it's slower and it's more expensive. Or um, if somebody manages uh, to reverse engineer the common DDR5 layers in the bigger FPGAs, we might be using uh, standard DDR memory, but that will take time. Um, well, we have FPGAs, but there are also projects for ASICs. I have already mentioned the Loris project, uh, which is working on an RV64 community SOC. Um, the current development version of the Loris SOC runs on an FPGA, and it actually runs Debian. Uh, the software development for that chip is actually using Debian. Then, uh, of course, if I want to mass produce a chip, uh, there's not only digital logic in it. The CPU itself is digital logic, but I need voltage regulators, I need analog digital converters, I need a random number generator, I need uh, brownout detection to make sure uh, that the voltage doesn't drop too much. So there's a lot of analog technology which you also need to produce such a chip. And uh, there's a spin-off uh, in Colombia, uh, spin-off of the Universidad Industrial de Santander in Colombia, which is working on providing open source licensed analog components for such CPU. There's also an Interesting project, several people will say that's just insane, but nonetheless I find it interesting. Um, the Libre Silicon Alliance uh, is a group of people uh, from, chip, from the chip design world which are trying uh, to define a standard silicon chip manufacturing process. Currently you have one problem, you want to produce a chip. You go to one chip fab and say, okay, here's my design, build that for me. You have to use a set uh, of standard cell libraries from your fab. You're not allowed to disclose how those look like. So if you want to build your chip in another fab, you can't just take your design to another fab. You have to redesign your, your chip with their standard cell library. There is no portability between fabs. And the Liberty Silicon Alliance is working on defining a standardized process that is actually transferable from one fab to another. 
Uh, they've started very, very small. Um, they currently have done their first prototype chips, which are based on one micrometer node size. That's technology from the early 80s. So nothing you, you could build a modern CPU in, uh, but that's a long-term project. Um, they're estimating a time frame of perhaps 10 or 15 years. So nothing for tomorrow, but nonetheless interesting. And then there's Chips for Makers, um, which is a project uh, to improve the software side for ASIC Design, uh, which also has a talk tomorrow upstairs. Um, they are aiming uh, to produce uh, a community-funded small CPU. This is 16-bit, 32-bit, uh, 68K, Z80 type stuff and uh, have actually managed uh, to get the design done, uh, but in the first round, the funding for the actual mass production of the chip uh, didn't work out. Uh, they're trying to do another run, uh, and we'll see how far they get. So that's my talk so far. Questions? It still needs to be ported, yes. It needs to have the Rust-specific patches to LLVM because Rust, the Rust community also has a set of patches which, which they didn't get upstream to LLVM. So even if you were in a situation where you had LLVM, you don't have necessarily Rust on the radio. Okay, I, tr I try to repeat that because yeah. the people on the stream probably haven't heard yeah, okay. the comment. Um, so. To get Rust, uh, one does not only need to have uh, LLVM working, uh, but there are also Rust-specific patches to LLVM which also need to be ported, which would also need to be done. To be upstreamed. Yeah, or, or to be upstreamed. And, and the question is, how is Debian handling those Rust-specific patches for LLVM? Uh, the question was, how is Debian handling those patches? Currently not at all. <laughs> We haven't actually looked into that yet. Okay. Further questions? I'm sorry, I didn't just didn't understand that acoustically. <laughs> Okay. Um, the question was, uh, Debian has rather recently bootstrapped um, ARM64, and uh, how much of the bootstrapping procedure has, have we been able to reuse for the Debian uh, RISC-V bootstrap? Actually, quite a bit uh, during the ARM64 bootstrap, um, several packages have gained build profiles uh, to make uh, dependency cycle resolution easier, and uh, that has actually helped a lot. Um, the RISC-V specific stuff, of course, can't take anything from ARM64, uh, but um, the infrastructure has gotten a lot better. And uh, there are people like Helmut Grone, who has written the Rebootstrap tool that I had mentioned, uh, are working uh, permanently on uh, making bootstrapability better um, by fixing cross-architecture bugs, um, by adding uh, more, uh, more build profiles. So that definitely has helped. I actually don't know. That has been handled by lawyers behind closed doors, and I have no information about that. <laughs> I, n not within Debian. Uh, Debian, okay, uh, i just repeat that. How was the legal problem with the copyright assignment uh, of the GCC code to the FSF been resolved? Um, I really cannot tell that, uh, because that was something that had been handled uh, between the RISC-V Foundation and the University of Berkeley, and they haven't told the public uh, in which specific way an agreement was reached, so I can't tell anything about that. I, 
I totally have sympathy with the work you've been doing and hopefully you're doing a good job. Um, it seems that the core package set size is growing. When we were doing RMHF, I think it was about 200 packages, and now you say it's more like 400. What's the worst pain point? I know you mentioned Maison is <laughs> now building, is dragging in a whole bunch of other things. Is that the only big one, or the others? Um, I'll just repeat for the stream listeners. Um, the question uh, was that uh, when uh, that the the base package set appears to be growing compared to past ports. Uh, when 32-bit ARM had been ported, the base package set had been something around 200 something packages. Now we have reached nearly 400. And uh, which uh, which problems have been the major pain, pain point in porting? The first major pain point is, has been Perl, the lack of cross bootstrapability of Perl, because because um, all of the packaging infrastructure in Debian is based on Perl. So you need Perl for almost everything. So getting, getting Perl ready uh, has been a real problem. Um, the second one, uh, in my view, has been Maison. But uh, perhaps where's Manuel? Um, perhaps you can comment on that. Can you talk a bit louder? I just don't hear you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's, um, um, the, the other week, the, so the one problem was the GDC, which was in experimental. That was where you, uh, we initially had problems with the reboot start. Mm -hmm. And then the one that I remember most per, per was a, a, a problem, uh, so one of the biggest problems. But the other one was um, still uh, many packages in, in the bootstrap um, for example for util don't cross build properly because they need to help to man for example to generate mm -hmm. uh, to generate the man pages and you have to run natively so um, there are uh, many small changes that packages need still to to get the base set and I think that those were the yeah, and in the media, there were patches from for users, for example, um, but they were not accepted sometimes by the maintainer, or they were uh, running behind. Um, yeah, I think that there were the many problems with the initial reboot stuff. Okay, I'll just repeat that for the people listening on the stream. Um, one of the pain points in the early bootstrap had been that uh, GLibc for, for risk 5 had only been in experimental because we had to use a newer version than all the other Debian architectures. Uh, and that caused some compatibility problems in the early bootstrap. And uh, then one problem has indeed been coutils uh, because uh, coutils uses help to man uh, to generate uh, man pages. And help to man uh, does not work in a cross setting. Um, that took quite a bit of workarounds uh, that should be resolved in a newer core utils version than we had at that time. But when we did the bootstrap, that was indeed a problem. Uh, that's, of course, another problem. Uh, when one builds an architecture in emulation in QAMO and uh, one has to handle a bug, the problem is, is the bug in the code I'm trying to debug or is the bug in the emulation I'm using to run the code? We had some cases uh, where the code actually was fine uh, and the bug was in the emulator, uh, which, of course, has needed time and a lot of debugging. Um, so having real hardware is, of course, better, but uh, when you start such a port, um, often you only have emulators. I suppose the ARM64 port had the same problem. You started with the original ARM architecture emulator. So that's something that's nearly unavoidable if you do an early bootstrap. That is easier if you wait with bootstrapping until the architecture has already brought use, but um, 
of course, you want to distribute software early in the release of new architecture to make the architecture actually usable. Further questions? So you've been talking about issues with uh, cross-compilation support on different build systems. Uh, so now that um, you have a bootstrap system, do you plan on always just using a native tool chain? Or do you try to keep the um, cross-compilation patches and maybe upstream them to um, have more reliable cross-compilation we, we have tried to get the cross-compilation patches upstream. Um, in some cases, that has worked and they were accepted. In some cases, they weren't because um, some people consider cross-build support a maintenance burden because you have to think of things uh, of which you don't have to think uh, when building natively. And, um, well, some upstream authors uh, don't see bootstrapping a new architecture as a relevant problem for their software. That's unfortunately, but that's reality. Yes, uh, we, we carry the patches in the Debian packages, okay. um, but we, we would have preferred to have them upstream, uh, but they weren't accepted, uh, just because the upstream developers consider X11 to be in maintenance mode. They don't want feature additions, even if it's just a new architecture. Any more questions? Um, we have um, a CI system running uh, Rebootstrap, Helmut Brunner's base bootstrap tool, which works with cross-building, and we have Jenkins jobs doing that. So uh, if you have packages that are part of the base systems, um, it's helpful to look at the Jenkins results and see if your stuff fails. Um, Debian has um, um, portal boxes for multiple architectures on which you as a package maintainer can log in on each architecture that Debian supports and try to build your stuff, and of course you can cross-build. We have cross-compilers in Debian. We ship cross-compilers for all architectures that we support in Debian. So um, the Debian packaging tools actually support cross-building packages. So you can uh, just say um, um, sbuild dash dash host arch is risk 5 64 and it runs a cross-compiler and tries to cross-build your package. So if you're a package maintainer, it's rather easy to check uh, whether your stuff is cross-buildable. That's more of a problem. Upstream is more of a problem. Um, we had some discussions yesterday evening uh, about ways to um, provide uh, RISC-V machine instances to upstream developers uh, to enable them to test build their code and debug issues on native hardware. That's being worked on. I just repeat that for the stream. Uh, the comment was uh, that we should try to avoid uh, bootstrapping risk 5 32 bit because other 32 bit architectures in Debian are already struggling uh, with keeping up and building large packages. One known problem is building stuff uh, like a debug build of Firefox, uh, which is a problem on 32 bit architectures, in fact. Yes. I would just like to uh, make a bit of a counterpoint to that. So I'm working on the FPGA tool stuff. And RV64GC is a pretty big ISA because you basically got to have hardware floating point. And that's not very fun to implement on an FPGA. Even with an ECP5, that's going to be most of your FPGA gone. Whereas RV32 is something that can very nicely fit on an FPGA and run quite well. So. OK, I'll just repeat that for the listeners on the stream. Uh, counterpoint to that argument uh, when one is targeting uh, CPU implementations on FPGAs, 64-bit uh, architectures are a problem because they use a lot more FPGA resources than 32-bit architectures, m way more than double of 32-bit architectures. 
and uh, getting uh, a 32 bit risk 5 cpu linux capable on an fpga is quite doable even on on smaller not tiny but smaller scale fpgas but 64 bit cpus is a problem in resource usage any more questions okay thanks <laughs>